Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Salim Hader, and this would be my second year doing a TEDx event here at Valencia High School. And I just want to say you guys have been an amazing, amazing audience thus far and very patient. So with that being in mind, I would love to get into my TEDx talk about a philosophical concept known as the experience machine. And the experience machine was invented by American philosopher Robert Nozick, who is a professor at Harvard University. And he taught at Harvard for uh, teaching philosophy for about 20 years. And he taught about a stuff ranging from political science all the way to existentialist ideas. And he even went on to win the Joseph Pellegrino Professorship Award at Harvard. And lastly, he was also president of the American Philosopher Association. And he's also very well known in the philosophical community for his celebrity counterpart, George Clooney. And if you look at the resemblance, I mean, not to go on a tangent, but the facial structure and the way the, fixture, the photo was taken, I mean, it's the same pose. It's too much to be a coincidence. But moving on from that, let's go about his idea, the experience machine. And the experience machine starts with, there were some neuropsychologists, or actually, I'm gonna quote him here. From his actual thesis, he used the word super-duper neuropsychologists. So this being said, um, these super-duper neuropsychologists created a sort of system. And the system was, was, there's a person, and that would be you, and you would be in this sort of fluid, and this machine would connect to your brain, and it would, uh, through electrodes, and it would fire the synapses in your brain, and put you in a sort of simulated reality. And this is really interesting, because in this simulated reality, what the experience machine entails is you would be able to make you the happiest person you could be. You would literally have a world tailored to your own perfection. You would be able to accomplish any goals you've ever wanted and fulfill any desires you've ever had. It, you would literally be the happiest person in the world. And going into this, the best way I can think of the experience machine is through the movie The Matrix. I don't know if anybody has ever watched The Matrix. Probably. It's a pretty good movie. It was in the 1990s, and it had four and a half stars. And I'm actually going to talk about some spoilers. So if you want to tune out this, you can. And I'll give you a warning later on. So um, it featured these really cool archetypal bad guys, the Smiths. And what they did was they would try to prevent humans from going in and out of The Matrix. And then they regulated the sort of control because the point of the matrix was to control the humans. But um, featuring um, this specific character, Cypher, in the movie, what Cypher did was, let's go back here. What Cypher did was, um, there's a scene, and I'll try and reenact it here for you, but my acting's pretty bad. So he took a, a, a piece of steak on a fork, and he looked at it, and he said, I know this steak isn't real. And I know, and when I pour it in my mouth, it's t the matrix is telling me, that it's juicy and delicious, but it's not really real. And you know what I realized? Ignorance is bliss. This character, Cypher, oh yeah, end scene. This character, Cypher, um, what he, he realizes that his real life was pretty miserable. He was on a spaceship on the run from the bad guys, the Smiths, and he was doing this um, because he didn't want or because the actual, he was so scared of being in a simulated reality. But what he realized was the steak, you derived pleasure from it, that it was like a real steak. You tasted it, it tasted delicious. So why would he want to be shoveling protein in his mouth on a spaceship running from bad guys when he could be totally oblivious and in this sort of simulated reality eating steaks? And he is the sort of bridge into something else that I want to talk about, and it's the concept of hedonism. And hedonism is the belief that happiness and maximum pleasure are the aims of human life. And this being said, I want to take the concept of hedonism and take the concept of the experience machine and merge them together into something called Fermi's paradox. And what Fermi's paradox is, is let's take it step by step. What it entails is that theoretically, there are a huge amount of stars in the galaxy. Let's say that there's quadrillions of stars in the galaxy. And of these quadrillions of stars, trillions of them have to be like the sun that we have here in our solar system. And this being said, there has to be an absurd amount of planets that are just like the Earth that we live on. And this is an example. This is Kepler-186f. And it's a planet that has an atmosphere like Earth. It has clouds. It has oceans. It has land. And it's very similar to the Earth in size. But this being said, let's go back to the Fermi's paradox. What Fermi's paradox asked the question of, if the universe is infinitely big and it's ever growing, theoretically, there should be an Earth that's in every stage of the timeline. There should be life forms that are like the ones that we live in now, or there should be life forms that were like Earth a thousand years ago or a thousand years in the future. So we send out sonar pings all across the galaxy to try to communicate or find other life forms, but we've never received any in return. So why is this being so? Why hasn't any life form trying to reach out to us? And a sort of, there's many, it's a paradox, so there's not a definite answer to this, but a quick 
explanation is something called the Aestivation hypothesis. And this is where the experienced machine and hedonism really come in. What the Aestivation hypothesis entails is that a society that's already been developed with the technology that's able to reach us no longer wants to. They've discovered a way from womb to tomb to be able to live the happiest lives they could ever want. From womb, they are put in this experience machine, and they have a world tailored to their perfection, as I mentioned earlier, and they have no need to explore and jeopardize that system that they have in place. They are quite literally the happiest people that they could ever be. And that's what the concept of hedonism is, is that we are motivated to do happy things, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. I can say that I'm motivated to do things that help others because it makes me feel good. I don't do things that intentionally make me feel bad. It just doesn't make sense. But this is just a hypothesis, as it's said in the name, and it's not a definite answer. And going back to the definition of hedonism, the belief that happiness and maximum pleasure are the aims of human life, it doesn't necessarily mean it's the aims of alien life. Who's saying that aliens feel emotion and they aren't just purely extinctive that are motivated by stuff that literally keeps them alive? Who's to say that they're not like General Zod from Superman, where they don't feel any emotions, they don't have empathy for others, and they just do things because they can? Well, moving on, how does this relate to the theme empower? That's why I'm standing here talking to you guys today, because I want to talk about stuff that empowers us. So I pose to ask the question, um, what makes you tick? What are the things that um, motivate you to wake up in the morning and go through your lives? I can say that when I wake up in the morning, usually it's around 6 o'clock, to go to school, and then I come home and do my homework and go to bed and rinse and repeat, it's a lot more than that. I don't just go through the motions, and there's a lot more that makes me tick, and a great allusion to this is a clock. When I think of a clock, what a clock does is a clock's hand, it ticks little by little, and it records the time. But if a clock stops ticking, does that mean the time stops? No. The clock just simply passes through time. It's sort of like a person, that um, if a person is not really being immersed into his own life and merely going through the actions, does his life stop going? No, he's just going through the motions. He's not really being ticked. There's nothing driving him. So what makes you tick? What makes you drive? And for me, I'll give a few examples. For me, what makes me tick is a bunch of things, like my family. I really am motivated by my family. I love to do things that make my family proud and that I can provide for my family, and being a good person so my family enjoys that I'm a good person. All those things, that's what makes me happy. That's what makes me um, wake up in the morning and go to school and be a good student and learn so many new things. And speaking of learning, that is a photo uh, I took a couple months ago when I visited Stanford. And I was just uh, on the campus touring, and when I was at Stanford, the atmosphere and the aura that you get there is just amazing. There are so many different people that are excited to learn, and that there's so much knowledge in the air that's either undiscovered or you can just grasp it. That there's a certain, you just feel like there's so much to learn when you're at Stanford, and that really motivates me, knowing that there's so much that I don't know in the universe and that there's so much that's left to be discovered. That's something that really makes me tick. And then the third thing, not the final thing, but the third thing is, this is a photo I took of the Grand Canyon when I visited a couple months ago. And I was sitting on the cliff of the, Gan the Grand Canyon and I was looking down and I realized, wow, I am very small. And I'm <laughs> the first thing that popped in my mind is a photo uh, that Carl Sagan took a while ago called the, big, the Little Blue Speck, sorry. And what it was is that there was a satellite, and it was exiting the Milky Way galaxy, and it turned around, and it took a photo of the entire galaxy. And all in the upper left corner, a little bit down, a little bit to the left, it showed a, a little blue speck, and it had a big circle. And that little blue speck was Earth. And, and I realized, wow, I'm, not only am I very small, that on Earth, countries fight, wars are waged, there's such huge conflicts, and that I have conflicts with other people and within myself, but they're so insignificant. And that might actually sound pretty depressing, but no. What I realized was that I have this small little amount of real estate, and in this amount of real estate, I can use it and make the most out of it. I can utilize it, and I can make it awesome. And not only can I make it awesome, I can also affect the other real estate, the people in the audience, you guys. And I can make a positive influence on people and make them uh, dream for big things and be able to accomplish things. But moving on, all of this, this is just me. And I'm sure every person has many different things that make them tick, that drive them to be immersed in their own lives. So I want to ask you the questions. I want to ask you, this is just me, not the, and I want to ask you guys to think about what makes you tick. Thank you very much.